thank you all for coming out today. My coworkers from the nursery, we don't get down here to the NRB very often. We're kind of storming the castle today. Everyone in the NRB here, you know, thanks for showing your interest in nursery research. It's much appreciated. So when I put together this flyer, I kind of put a smorgasbord of topics up here. I'm really going to be focused on talking about soil biofumigation work that we've been doing. Um, herbicides, our herbicide program is something I'll be talking about next month at the reforestation workshop, making some parallels between what we do, stuff out in the woods. Webster has, you know, those are both bare root topics. We also have a container program. And I just want to briefly talk about some of the container trials that we've done. Kyla Binge is our greenhouse manager, and she comes from an ornamental background, and she brought some ideas on plant growth regulators that are used in that field. And we worked with Syngenta, a manufacturer that makes a product called Bonsai, kind of a clever name for a plant growth regulator. And we did a series of trials working with alder, which grown in container can really kind of get out of hand. You have to wait for it to root in, and in the meantime, it gets sort of leggy. And this is a stock type that we transplant from the greenhouse to the bare root fields, and it tends to take that transplant poorly. They sort of fall over, they get sunburned, various things like that. With the plant growth regulator, we feel like we have it dialed in pretty well now after like 10 treatments and timings and things like that. This is a third year, and we've left the control here again just for look-see, but you can see that the PGR applied to alder here, it results in this compact plant. It's filled in its root system. It has stem diameters that are equal to the untreated plants, and it's got these thick, dark leaves that are waxier. I mean, it's really like a magic spray. It's very impressive. It, it makes the plant uh, easier to transplant, more resilient out in the field, and we get a higher pack out at transplant. So it's been encouraging and fun to see that that's been adopted by other alder growers in the Pacific Northwest. So that's been something recently in the greenhouse. Blackout is some trials that we've been doing, labor-intensive trials, where a lot of people in the nursery have helped out, including Dutch on weekends and stuff, where we forklift trees around to make this happen. Blackout or short photo periods um, that you artificially impose in otherwise long growing, long growing days, say the middle of summer, you take a November-like photo period and you impose that on, on the plants and it causes them to set a bud and harden up. And this is technology that's used a lot in the state of Washington, especially on a recently legalized major agricultural sector blackout for setting buds. It's also used in reforestation conifers and somewhat controversially. It's about 50-50 from British Columbia down to Oregon, the greenhouse growers who use blackout. When you give them this strong signal of blackout, what you do is you're almost flipping a switch and you're triggering the plant to set a bud, to darken up, to harden. And superficially, it's some people call it the shiny apple. You have this very nice looking tree what we're finding, however, is that you can throw the rhythm of the tree. Physiologically, you can, biologically, you can throw it off rhythm. So say you take a stock type like alder that starts in the greenhouse and then goes out to the bare root field, we're finding that they can wake up again in mid, late October, just when you don't want that to happen as your first hard freezers are coming and even with frost protection, you can burn some growth. This right here is an what we call an outplant stock type. It's a styro 15 or 15 cubic inches of soil. It's designed to go straight out to the field from the greenhouse. And when you shut these down hard with blackout, what we find is that you've sort of shifted the cycle. So you shut them down a little earlier, but then the following spring, they wake up earlier as much as they break bud them as much as seven, eight, nine days earlier in our field simulated nursery trials. And that has potential consequences for late spring freezes and damage out in the woods. We have a trial this year that we're doing comparing BC, Washington, and Oregon genetics. We grow a lot of Oregon genetics at the nursery on contract with ODF and Roseburg. And Oregon dug fir, what we'll call southern dug fir, it is 
it likes to grow more in the shoulder seasons um, compared to Washington, especially British Columbia. It grows more in mid-spring and mid-fall. And so the consequences of blackout uh, are potentially more severe where they're already breaking bud relatively early. So if you're interested in learning more about those topics, feel free to chat with me one-on-one -on -one or Kyla. There's papers that we have to date on both these topics. So this is a presentation I gave a couple weeks ago at our combined annual meeting down in Troutdale. McMinniman's a fantastic place to have a conference. Unfortunately, my wife is a physical therapist. She said, uh, no drinking while crutching. So I had to uh, cough up my drink tickets to the coworkers there. And they got a designated driver out of the deal, too. This is a collaborative project that we're doing with Weyerhaeuser. Anna Leon and John Browning are plant pathologists out of Federal Way and Centralia. And this is uh, a collaborative project uh, at Weyerhaeuser's Mima Nursery, along with Webster. Mima, as you might guess, is about 12 miles south of here. The outline for the presentation here, I'll give a little more preamble, since people may not be as familiar with what we do. I'm going to start off talking about why we're still addicted to methyl bromide. It's a really, really effective treatment, both from a grower's perspective as well as a field forester perspective. And I'll look at both sides of that. I'll go over some alternatives that we've explored to date, both at our nursery and in collaboration with other nurseries. And then I'll really focus on biofumigation and some trials that we've done with cover crops, uh, green manures that are chopped tilled, incorporated into the soil for a biofumigation effect, and the use of seed meals, which is seed meals being the byproduct, brassica mustard seed meals from, if you've ever been driving through eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, and sort of these fields of gold that go on, you might be looking at uh, canola oil fields or certain brassica fields, and it's a high quality oil. The byproduct is seed meal. That's what we care about crushing, incorporating into the soil for a biofumigation effect. And then sort of the main data that I'm presenting today is going to be this commercial product called Dominus, which is a close, it's a synthetically produced, but it's a very close mimic of the naturally occurring active compound in the Brassica family. And both ourselves and Weyerhaeuser were interested in trialing this product, hadn't been trialed before on conifers, and that's what I'm reporting here today. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the fumigation process and particularly the way we do it, this rig here is called the noble plow. And you can see the gas canisters up above. Sometimes it's in liquid form, converted to gas, injected into the soil through shanks. And there's a port about eight inches down on the shanks. And the gas goes through. It's immediately tarped with a layer of plastic. And the idea is to trap those gases as effectively as you can in the soil. This is a biocide. And its intention is to maximize the number of kill hours in the soil and to kill everything in the soil. And when it's done effectively, it really becomes the foundation of a bare root grower's integrated pest management program. It's the foundation because it addresses disease, weeds, insects, and Conversely, there's not a great need to apply fungicides, herbicides, insecticides when you have effective fumigation. This is a photograph from a cooperative nursery down in Oregon, and you can see in the background here are trees from a methyl bromide chloropicrin fumigated plot. And in the foreground here is an untreated control or check plot. And you can see weeds coming up. You can see trees flagging off. And this is pretty dramatic difference here that we sometimes see. But sometimes the differences aren't as great as this, and you'll have trees maybe more like in the foreground, even a little bit better, that they make what we call packable specifications or packable specs. They have adequate stem diameter, height, you lift them, their root volumes are large, large enough and in proportion. And the question has come up, what, were you, what would happen if you say, okay, we're going to take 20% additional cull when we don't fumigate? But what happens when you compare these packable seedlings from the untreated plots to trees from methyl bromide fumigated ground? This is Lucy right here. Lucy, my audience. 
She is retiring October 31st, around in 26 years, congratulations. We work with Lucy on stock type trials and trials like this where we want to see what the effect of nursery treatments are planted out into the woods. And Lucy and Greg and I from Jeff's shop, DeGrand's shop, we planted this back in 2009. Uh, again, seedlings from untreated ground versus fumigated ground. The trees from unfumigated ground were a little bit smaller morphologically, significantly so, but they definitely had a heavier pathology load. And what we found was that those untreated trees were significantly smaller as the years went on compared to the methyl bromide trees. Here's what it looks like in graph form. The y-axis here, you have stem volume. And again, a small but significant difference starting off. By year seven, 37% increased growth in terms of volume from those trees from fumigated ground. This was one trial across two sites, no interactions, combined the data there. The following year, we had two additional separate alternatives to methyl bromide trials in. And again, we took trees that had been from fumigated ground versus unfumigated. This was, so two trials over three sites, a little bit bigger difference in initial morphology, although everything was a packable tree, still had those pathology differences on the roots. And you can see that by year five here, 45% increase in stem volume compared to those trees from unfumigated ground. So you can see why both from a nursery perspective as well as a field forester perspective, this is a valuable treatment. But as you may have heard, it's going away. In fact, technically we don't have it anymore. One slide overview of methyl bromide. In the 70s and 80s, it was identified as an ozone depleting compound. And then in 1990, there was an international agreement signed on by the US included saying, okay, this is gonna be completely banned by the year 2001. And then 2005, they say, okay, now it's really gonna be banned. But the forest nursery industry has held on in part on the coattails of larger industries like strawberries and almonds and cut flowers. And it's held on through what are called QPS or quarantine pre-shipment exemptions. And these have to do with the fact that we're distributing our product far and wide and limit the spread of disease. There's been additional regulations that have come on. In 2008, the EPA announced a relabeling of all commercial fumigants, not just methyl bromide and chloropicrin, but all commercial fumigants. And they, this includes uh, Fumigation management plans uh, are ratcheted up in the intensity of those plans. And one of the most strict part of those plans would be the inclusion of puff buffer zones. And this took place in late 2011, early 2012 it was implemented. So here's our nursery. This is roughly the plowable acres highlighted in green. And a buffer zone is defined as the critical distance between the nearest edge of a fumigated field and the closest occupied dwelling or pedestrian right of way. So if you have a 100 foot buffer zone, you take out more than a quarter of the ground that can be fumigated. If you have a 200 foot buffer zone, you're looking at more than half the ground that can be fumigated. And if you have a 300 foot buffer zone, then you really only have a quarter of the ground left here that you can fumigate. And this was alarming to John very concerning. He organized a conference back in 2008, invited the EPA who attended. Several nurseries in our industry came as well, educational institutions. And out of that conference, out of that meeting, I should say, came a real burst in collaborative research. One of the main trials to come out of that was a, a commercial fumigant alternative trial. And it was looking at some of the most promising alternatives at the time back in the late 2000s. Uh, methyl iodide, dimethyl disulfur, and metam sodium, which is commercially known as vapam. These are all in combination with uh, this fumigant chloropicrin. And at the same time, there were advances in plastic tarp technology. HDPE stands for high density polyethylene. This was the standard practice for decades. And HDPE is kind of a misnomer because really that plastic was no thicker than like an inexpensive sandwich bag and more than half of gases could volatilize right through it. At the time of this trial, VIF or very impermeable film was state of the art and that is essentially three layers 
of plastic woven together and bonded. And nowadays we have something called TIF, or totally impermeable film, which is five layers of plastic polymer bonded together. It's kind of like Gillette razor blades. What do they think of next? Seven layers of plastic, but TIF is really valuable to us because it's very effective at holding gases in the soil. It allows us to reduce the size of those buffer zones. And because it traps gases so well in the soil and they can biodegrade down there, we are able to use less fumigant as well uh, and get more efficacy, I should say, out of the fumigant. We can reduce buffer zones that way. If I go back a slide. There's other ways you can reduce buffer zones. You can cut some of your larger fields in half and have them fumigated at one point and then come back a couple of weeks later and fumigate again. That gives you a the size of the field, you can reduce your buffer zone that way. So here, that, let's, I should say that fumigant trial was put in at three nurseries, a uh, Weyerhaeuser and an IFA nursery down in the Willamette Valley, also at our nursery. This is an 11 acre field here. And these are GPS coordinates before the trial went in. John had partnered a pilot project with a guy named David Shear. He's talking next week at the Reforestation Council meeting, he runs a company called Eagle Imaging. And at the time he was doing flyovers of agricultural enterprises, marketing, among other things, plant vigor mapping. And I want to point out the control plots. This is a large scale trial in 11 acre field. And the third fly, by the third flyover, we could really see where those control plots were. Cooler colors indicate lower plant vigor. Or, you know, this blue around the field is a road. There's some mature Douglas fir down there. Those control plots really stand out. And we can see other things from imaging, like this uh, field get, got transplanted up from the south and down from the north. And you can see even by mid-August here, you know, the trees in the center of the field are still lagging behind. So we're excited about, what did they call it, Area 51, the drone shop out there. Can I call you guys the drones? But it's a, uh, this is, field's gonna be planted next spring. It's a large field. You got, your location is just right here. An osprey nest is right here. So it's a great test to see how the drones and the osprey get along. We can get a lot of information out of that. So other treatments in this trial performed actually pretty well in comparison with methyl bromide and chloropicrin. One of them was methyl iodide. It never got fully registered. There were issues with mammalian toxicity. And so that was a non-starter. Dimethyl disulfide, as the name might indicate, kind of smells like rotten eggs, or even worse, like propane. And this field was away from neighbors, but weeks, months after we pulled the plastic, even the following spring, we could still get a hint, uh, a whiff of that. So, not good. Metam sodium, I mentioned here, it's not easy to work with for the applicators. It's corrosive on equipment as well, and it did well in this trial, but it's never going to be used by the fumigators that we work with. I mention it because its active ingredient, MITC, or methyl isothiocyanate, is a direct parallel to the active ingredient in biofumigation with the Brassica family. And biofumigation is part of what I'll call other fumigant alternatives that we've been looking at. We did a compost trial a few years back, and we had two main requirements for this trial. First, the materials had to be locally available, say within 45 minutes of the nursery. Compost is heavy, reduced trucking costs. And second, it had to be available on an industrial scale because going operational, we'd be thinking of, you know, enough to apply to up to 60 acres a year. And there are various materials right in the corner there. That green bucket is the yard food waste, Silver Spring Organics out in Tenino. Biosolids is Tacoma's finest, and all these composts did pretty well, especially the biosolids and the composted woody material. They did very well. The trick was, or the catch was, is that they only did well in a fumigated system, and the non-fumigated system, the pathology level on the roots were very high. This is one of the trials that we planted out with roughly comparable morphology, but high pathogen loads that ultimately didn't do well in the woods. Solarization 
or heating soil under plastic is another avenue of research. Jennifer Park is a pathologist at OSU, Corvallis there, and she's been putting in these solarization plots up and down the west coast. We, she had plots out at our nursery in 2013. In 2014, particularly hot summer, uh, she was able to get a lot of kill hours down to six inch depth in the soil um, through temperature, but only enough to take out some of our weaker pathogens. And on the right here is a trial at Mima Nursery, our neighbor, with the latest solarization plastic from Israel, which does a better job trapping heat under the plastic. But unfortunately, we're not, you know, California Salinas Valley. We're not even the Willamette Valley. And when you get like a late June and July, like us, it's a crapshoot. Not a lot of solarization hours for a lot of the summer here. So biofumigation. Textbook definition, it's the release of volatile breakdown products from organic amendments that are toxic to pathogens. And this can be plants like the sorghum family, like Sudan grass, or it can be rye grass that have a biofumigation effect. Our industry, and in general what's been studied the most lately, is the brassica or mustard family. And the brassica family has what are called it's glucosinolates. They're a secondary plant metabolite. They're a natural herbivore defense. And when a plant is crushed or macerated, these glucosinolates are released, an enzyme called myrosinase, then breaks them down and converts them into isothiocyanate. We got together with Lynn Carpenter Boggs, professor over at WSU Pullman in the BioAg program there. And she had access to some of the latest cultivars of brassica species that were bred specifically for high glucosinolate content. Also, she had, we were looking at seed meals. This was a relatively recent development. Again, it's a byproduct of the mustard oil, canola oil industry, Eastern Washington there. The glucosinolate content from seed meals is two or three times higher than the green material. So first trial here, we made Basically a soilless media. We did have 10% soil there from Webster Nursery of a known pathogen content. Mix those with inert ingredients. Simulated fumigation in these thick plastic bags. I want to emphasize that this is a warm temperature fumigation. Then we potted these up into tall one gallons and evaluated them at our nursery as well as W.C. Pullman's research greenhouses. What we saw were some immediate phytotoxicity, almost instantaneous, and sometimes these seed meals um, are used as, as herbicides. Certain of those cultivars killed the trees, dug us fur almost right away. Others had a beneficial effect where they were able to suppress some of our most important pathogens. And that was exciting. Right away, we took it out to the field. This is Dutch tilling in one or two ton per acre treatments of various cultivars. But unfortunately, things went south really quickly. We had some early on mortality. We also had some chlorosis and stunting. This is the same year that we had those flyovers from Eagle Imaging. And again, the cooler colors indica indicate lower plant vigor. You can, the purple would be unplanted ground. You can see those cool strips here correspond over here on the left to the series of brassica seed meal treatments and untreated controls. And whereas methyl bromide up here corresponds, this is all methyl bromide treated ground where these seedlings are with the warmer colors. It's a good time to talk about gas diffusion in the soil. One of the things that makes methyl bromide so effective is that it moves very readily in the soil. This is at 20 C, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. But even down at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, it really moves and distributes. Methyl iodide, which didn't get registered for good reasons, it also moves well. MITC or METAM, uh, the one I mentioned, much slower. Its granular cousin is basimate. It's used in forest service nurseries, much slower in its movement. Chloropicrin, I've been mentioning, is a partner that we use often with the fumigants. And there you can see AITC or brassica. It's really a passive fumigant. So knowing that it's not going to move very well, we shifted from cool season to warm season, or fall fumigation trials, we call them. And this is a trial at Webster in 2009. This is trials at IFA Toledo, 
Nursery, Toledo, Washington to the south of us. You can see Green Manure Incorporation or Crushed Seed Meals. We had inconsistent results. In the center here, you can see good lateral branching, long needle lengths, same perspective as the photo on the right. You can't see my boots here. Here you can because we had poor lateral branching patchwork throughout the plots as well as shorter needle lengths. So one of the things that we found was that green manures, somewhat to our surprise, actually outperformed the seed meals, but they both showed inconsistent pathogen control. And the thinking is, you know, these are materials you have to apply a lot of them uniformly. They have to go into the ground. They have to convert over and kill the pathogens. And if that doesn't happen, all those steps, then you're just adding a nitrogen source or an organic matter source, and you might be not knocking down the pathogens and even feeding them. And indeed, some of the brassica plots were actually worse than the untreated controls. So we felt like we'd come to the end of the line here with biofumigation and brassica. But an Italian company with its U.S. subsidiary, Asagro, had, develop, had been developing a product called Dominus, kind of a weird name. I don't recommend you Google that, especially on a government computer. Weird things come up, but... <laughs> Anyhow, I'll refer to it as AITC, it's active ingredient, and you can see 96% concentration. This is strong stuff. It's synthetically made, but it's a close enough mimic to the naturally occurring compounds in the Brassica family that the EPA decided to fast track it through its biopesticide program. And, you know, very similar, actually stronger than MEDAM, but they fast tracked it through its bio biopesticide program. This had benefits including maximum buffer zone to 25 feet, including if you have what the EPA calls a difficult to evacuate site, like a daycare or something like that, where the buffer zones, we're talking eighth of mile, quarter mile, basically covers the whole nursery. Among the other benefits, it's injected through traditional fumigation equipment, like that noble plow I showed you, so easy to work with that way. And being a passive fumigant, it is a better fit for warm soil application, which we can do at our nursery, and nurseries with lighter soils, which forest nursery industry almost by definition has. We have to have light soils because, you know, we're lifting in winter, things like that. Yeah. Is there, uh, I mean, if, I don't know if this is a digression, is there any reason to believe that Dominus is less environmentally toxic than methyl bromide? So, methyl bromide has the ozone depletion factor, and Dominus AITC certainly doesn't have that. So, there's that aspect. In terms of human health inhalation exposure, EPA terms, there is lower risk that's been determined in that the product breaks down in the soil, organic matter and stuff like that breaks it down more readily than it does methyl bromide. Methyl bromide gets broken down in the soil too, but it happens a little faster with AITC. Although I'll point out that under, later here, under TIF plastic, it's a little bit of a different story, but there are differences that have been documented. Okay. So we got together, like I said, with Weyerhaeuser as Maima Nursery, and we paired up, increased the power of the test, and here's the treatments. We have AITC at a max rate of 40 gallons, or 340 pounds per acre. Then we also have a a heavy dose of chloropicrin here, 250 pounds. We also matched up a combination treatment of AITC with 125 pounds of chloropicrin. And so fumigants, when applied together, often have a synergistic effect, meaning they're you know, greater than the sum of their parts. So say I decided to, presentation day, I'm gonna douse myself in cologne. And Ted walks in here and is just gagging from the other side of the room. And so, what he's gagging on is the perfume molecules from the cologne, but it's the alcohol in the cologne that are dragging those perfume molecules over to him. And much the same way, fumigants can drag each other around the soil. So this is a combination treatment. Operational treatment at both nurseries is also combination methyl bromide, chloropicrin, and then we have an untreated control. The pathologists kind of bemoaned that they didn't have an untreated control at Weyerhaeuser, but sometimes that happens. All these treatments were done under TIF plastic. So here's what it looked like installing. This is a year ago at Webster. 
About three weeks later, we used this enormous 50-pound cookie cutter to cut the plastic and vent. And venting is something TIF does a really good job of holding what gas is remaining into the soil. You have to wait a minimum of two hours. Uh, we were in there, Eric, Dutch, and I, about six hours afterwards. And we're like, man, does it smell like, it smell like sushi? Or? We were getting a big dose of wasabi. Not a big dose. We were getting a dose of wasabi. We call this wasabi gas. Uh, now, it sounds better than mustard gas. You know, that's, that's something different from what wasabi gas. And even though something's a biopesticide or labeled as organic, doesn't mean that you shouldn't treat it with all the proper precautions and PPE that you would a conventional pesticide. We left the area, came back the next day. The sensory inputs were gone. The trial then overwinters, and the following spring, you transplant in. This is our best transplanting crew, including Abuelita, Veronica, Rosa. The trial goes in. This is what it looks like at Maima. And you can see same number of trees, but they did two or three strips wide and a couple hundred feet long. John wasn't quite ready to bite off on that one yet. So standard for fall fumigation trials, pathology sampling timeline. First thing you do, you get a pre-fumigation baseline soil sample. Then about a week after you pull the plastic, you take a follow-up soil sample, see what kind of knockdown you have. The following spring, just before transplanting, take another soil sample and also get a baseline of the root pathogens of those seedlings before they hit the soil. And then the fourth time plant I'll show you is in late July, where we sampled again the soil and then dug seedlings. That's Amy there taking samples. This here is the first thing I'll be showing you, soil dilution plating of fusarium. Selective media, one of the magic ingredients for fusarium is V8 juice, which I hate, but fusarium loves. You can see the colonies there. And fusarium is reported as propagules or colony forming units per gram of dry soil. Here's the baseline at Webster, and we're averaging about 400 CFUs, which is approaching the area, you know, pathologists say, time to fumigate. Uh, let's see. Now we are a week after we've pulled the plastic, and we were really impressed. You can see that there has been considerable knockdown, almost complete knockdown, by just about all the treatments. Chloropicrin, that heavier dose alone, is trending a little bit higher. There's a lot of variability in pathology work, and so that's no, there's not a significant difference there. The following spring, there is a little bit of a creep up and the AITC alone means that share the same letter are not significantly different. So not different than the PIC, the combo treatments, nor is it different from the control. And by late July, fusarium had gone pretty low uh, across all the treatments. Here's what it looked like at Weyerhaeuser's nursery. Again, they only had the three treatments, the wasabi gas, the wasabi combo with PIC, and the methyl bromide PIC. And their propagule levels, their CFUs are starting off more averaging up around 1,000. So heavier load got taken way down. And fusarium is not an easy, uh, easy pathogen to control. It's probably the hardest one we deal with. Impressive numbers. And stayed low the following spring, stayed low until late July. Pythium is uh, a water mold, behaves like a fungus takes advantage of wetter situations. There wasn't a lot of it in this trial, but um, here you can see the untreated control considerably higher than the other treatments. Again, the AITC doing a good job at knocking it down. So what about fusarium on the roots? I mean, what we care most about is what the seedlings are actually picking up. And here you can see from the baseline and digging the trees, this is what plating looks like. Um, Amy Salomon is a pathology tech at Weyerhaeuser. She did a lot of work. This was like 2,000 plates per nursery, per sampling point in this trial here. And you can see these root pieces um, can pick up fusarium. And so what I'm reporting here is the percent fusarium infection on roots here. And the blue bar, so percent fusarium root infection, the blue bars represent those seedlings from the previous year, right before they went into the soil as a baseline, the orange bars are what we were seeing in late July. And again, this was impressive. 
whereas the control was up towards 20%, which again is sort of a, a critical level for pathologists in terms of seedling effects. These other treatments were riding significantly lower. Again, chloropicrin alone is averaging a little bit higher, but not significantly different than those other treatments. Uh, not showing it today, but at Weyerhaeuser, this nursery, they started off with low fusarium root infection, and there are three treatments, the AITC, the combo treatment, methylbromine, those all remain low both at May sampling and in late July. Let's talk weeds. This is a photo from about a week after we pulled the plastic at our nursery, and we cover crop with brassica, and sometimes it goes to seed. And what you're looking at is the plot this has been tarped here, and then the AITC fumigant has been injected, starting with the blue flag there. And what you're looking at is, let's see, there's brassica germinants coming up here, and apparently mustard on mustard crime, because where the AITC is, there were no germinants coming up. And this was really encouraging to us because it gave us an indication that the gas was moving from the eight inch depth up to the soil surface. Here's what a plot looked like untreated in late November. You can see those weeds coming in, including annual bluegrass. And here is an AITC alone treatment. You can see it's a clean plot. There's weeds outside the plot. Average weeds per four square feet by late February. You can see that all the treatments average lower in terms of weed counts. Chloropicrin, which isn't really known as a particularly good herbicide, is a little bit higher and is not significantly different from the control there. So we had really low weed pressure in season and we're feeling good about some of the herbicide work that we've done and gone operational with. This is an untreated plot with low weeds here. There's a parallel out in the woods that's uh, Pindar. It's a combination that's about to get registered, good environmental profile. It's been registered in California and gonna be registered in Oregon and Washington shortly. I think foresters will find that they may like that one. I uh, just mentioned that Weyerhaeuser also had low weed pressure, but they did have, remember it was a really wet winter, like 60 inches of rain from October to March. They had a wash in on one edge of their field and they had bluegrass that came in. They feel that it came in after the fumigation treatment, so it was not a fumigation effect there. Morphology was not different at the nurseries. Um, height and stem diameter that we've measured so far. There were minor trends at both nurseries, but not, the variability covers that over. Now, we've now stressed the seedlings, we'll go into the fall, we'll measure additional things like shoot and root volumes, but at this point, no differences in morphology. So, summing it up here, all the treatments reduced fusarium, initially compared to the control, following spring, AITC alone crept up a little bit, wasn't significantly different than the control for roots, Fusarium percent root infection was up at 20%. The other treatments were down three or four times lower. Um, for weeds, there were lower weed counts at Webster except for that chloropicrin treatment that I mentioned that wasn't different than the control. And low weed pressure at both nurseries with that after fumigation washing of weeds at MIMA. Again, there were no Treatment differences to date in height or stem diameter, this may change, but if it doesn't, and you have seedlings that are comparable morphologically, but with differences in their root pathogens, I think it would be worthwhile planting out in the woods. And one of the things that we're doing in this trial that we haven't done before is we're gonna look at fusarium at the DNA level. Uh, Weyerhaeuser pathologist Anna Leone, she did her PhD three or four years ago on looking, you know, using real-time PCR, which you can, it turns out that the Fusarium oxysperum, that we always thought was our bad actor, it's actually non-pathogenic. It looks identical under the microscope, these canoe-shaped spores, to Fusarium communi, which is pathogenic. And so you can get a ratio of these pathogens. And once we know that ratio, that'll give us more information for tracking the seedlings out in the woods, controlling for equal size. We just put in a follow-up trial last week, and we're in a particularly heavy pathogen field. It's a little unique in that we had some overflow, and so this will be the second cycle in unfumigated ground for part of the trees. Maybe answer some additional things there. And then in the background, Isagro 
uh, down in Hollister, California, their lab, they're working with a new emulsifier, an improved emulsifier to help the product move even better through the soil and that's going to be available as soon as next year. So with that, a lot of people to acknowledge. Anna and John, I've mentioned, Amy Salomon did all that plating. She's going to do some PCR work as well. At Webster, Eric and Dutch, it's just great having operational folks who care about research because they make sure that the research fields get treated, importantly, the same operational treatments as everything else, and you get a legitimate trial that way. That way. Kyla and Amy have done a lot of data uh, collection, and Ted has pitched in as well, and they've all went over the presentation, got to listen to me, you know, give me feedback in the presentation, so I appreciate that. And finally, Jeff out of Trident Ag, um, he is our fumigator, runs that crew. These are not easy trials to put in, these swimming pool trials, I call them. It's a lot of maneuvering. You have to dial the rates in very carefully. He obviously gets some benefit from the information, but he works with us really well. So with that, are there any questions? I have a question for you. Yeah, How do the different treatments compare in terms of cost? Okay, I took that slide out. Um, 2016 costs. So the most recent information we have is $2,200 per acre. Uh, let's see, $1,800 per acre for AITC alone, $2,200 in combination with chlorpicrin, whereas methyl bromide pick is running $1,300 per acre. So $900 per acre more if you're talking about the full combination or $500 less. And the company knows that they may be the only show in town too, so I'm not sure if they're going to lower that cost. That's not including whatever the treatment, you have additional $1,200 per acre for the plastic and the installation. So these aren't cheap treatments, but this is a high value crop, you know, upwards of $47,000, $50,000 per acre. So it's something to consider for sure. Lower rates is an avenue that we could look at, different kind of plastic, because the plastic itself is expensive. Those might be two ways we could reduce the cost. Lucy? Well, the, the joke was, you saw that graph, that was agricultural usage in California and kind of, you know, dipped, you know, and then the joke is that at the current rate, we'll lose methyl bromide at the year 2100. So, <laughs> I'll be done. <laughs> but it, the truth is, and one of the things that we learned at the conference was talking, there's a, a Southern Auburn, the Southern Nursery Cooperative, he's pretty dialed into the legal affairs. There's another relabeling of all commercial fumigants coming up um, starting now and should take effect in 2019 or 2020. Any year it could be pulled at this With point. With regards to the Montreal Protocol and so on, EPA's new labels that came out in 2012 expressly says four season nurseries pre quarantine exemption for soil treatment is included on the label and the US State Department has backed that up with regards to its interpretation of the Montreal Protocol in the US use. So that's settled for right now, but like you Bill said, we found out uh, last week at the nursery conference, Scott Edenbeck out of Auburn said that EPA is starting another round of um, pre-registration review of all the sort of communication products. So here we go again. Another another context on that is for you know our FSC certification. FSC has considered including nurseries and orchard in its forest management standard. And so at the, for the present that's not going to happen. But if that did happen, you know, then we would at a, be at a difficult decision point. You know. Do we continue our certification? You know, what, what are our options, which aren't great, obviously. And notice that yeah. all the trials I talked about were second year trials. You know, the seed, you know, seed bed trials, you know, these are, so these are a one, one dug first stock type is what's typical. So this is the second year they're going in. From seed bed, it's even more intense, the issues you can have with soil pathogens. One of the lines of thinking is that if methyl bromide fumigation goes away and we don't have an alternative, this is the most promising thing we've had so far, but container transplant to bare root, where you're the relatively disease-free environment of a small container, and then you transplant that to the bare root is one alternative, more expensive. 
And the bill had mentioned the hard to evacuate sites such as a daycare or a prison or school or whatever. All we would need is a daycare, to, you know, licensed daycare right on our property line. Now we've got a quarter mile, or eighth of a mile to a quarter mile um, no fumigation buffer. So between the uh, EPA registration, FSC certification, daycare, hard to evacuate uh, sites and so on, it's still... There's, there's a nursery in Canby that has daycare slash church right on its property and so they're very interested in this product for those reasons. talked about that originated from um, brassica. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a variety of brassica that's used for canola oil? Brassica gensia is canola. Yeah. And so, but there's a lot of cultivars. Right. Uh, and so, and some of them, and so University of Idaho and WSU Pullman together, it's U of I where they actually started the research back in the late 80s. They start, you can breed these cultivars specifically for it. In fact, we use one as a cover crop called caliente, like hot. And, <laughs> and it's high in glucosinolate content. So. Those, those chemicals are directed at controlling insect pests? Um, they've been most widely used as herbicides, but they are also used, they are also used in it's developing. Right now there's trials in raspberries. Although, and strawberries, the same fumigator just put a trial in in strawberries. The raspberry growers, um, they have not been tarping their trials. And back to the point you made, Calvin, about how much chemical, it, you know, and how long does it take to break down, they're finding that when you don't tarp it, because you, you don't have to tarp AITC Dominus, you can just apply water on it or just seal it. But they're finding that it's not as efficacious. And tarping really is important. So thanks very much for coming out today. Appreciate it.